And now my pleasure to introduce uh, the next speaker, Janet uh, Kuo. We had already yesterday the privilege to listen to an architect, uh, Tatiana Bilbao, talking about the uh, role and showing also uh, and make us hear the role of sound in architecture. And uh, now it's great to have Janet uh, Kuo here. We, we kind of used to look at architecture mainly through our eyes, because of course we look at images so often of architecture, we look at drawings, uh, and, and we tend to, to forget that we are not only floating eyes without bodies, uh, but that we are actually also have bodies that, that touch, that feel, that, that smell, and that hear. And this is why we thought uh, the, the voice of architecture and the, the sensibility to the environment, the acoustic environment, is also something which we would like to have. And uh, Janet Kuo is, is perfectly uh, equipped to, to tell us that. Uh, Janet is an architect. She founded uh, uh, Karamuk Kuo together with her partner office in, in Zurich. And she is professor also at the Harvard uh, Graduate School of Design. Uh, I've visited some of your uh, buildings recently, uh, school buildings, kindergarten buildings in the area around Zurich, and uh, I, I loved very much the, the view, the sight, but there was something else, uh, and I, I didn't really know what it was until I realized that the acoustics was so great. And this was a school building, and uh, I myself have some, uh, you probably all, traumatic memories of school buildings uh, related not only to smell um, but also to noise, uh, uh, this incredible noise that, that's around. And in this school building uh, there was not silence, no, but there was a kind of a f way to focus uh, and, and feel the presence of the environment. And of course I, yeah, I wanted to know more about that, and it's, it's great that uh, Janet is here. Welcome. <laughs> thank you, thank you. So, good morning. Uh, thank you for being here, especially after last night's amazing party. And, uh, and also, um, it's, it's amazing to be able to present here amongst um, all these uh, amazing speakers, um, and, and also a tough act to follow that last talk, which was really quite mind-blowing. Um, and today, I'm not going to actually talk so literally about acoustics um, in our spaces, although that has a huge impact, obviously, on the way that we design, and, um, and also, um, you know, we can talk about that later in, in questions if that's of interest. Um, but in a way, I'd like to talk about how space communicates, and especially how space communicates long after the architect has left the room, and what that actually means for us designers. And to do so, I'm, I'm going to be using two of the recent projects, uh, actually projects that uh, Philip kind of referred to. Um, these are projects that I, you know, um, did together with our office, um, Karamukwo, which I founded with uh, Unal um, almost 10 years ago. So this year actually is a also a very significant year for our office. Um, we architects have a reputation for being control freaks. Um, but if you look at it from the other side, from, from our perspective, um, sometimes being an architect actually feels like you're being chained by contradicting demands um, and then being asked to release yourselves uh, from those demands like a magician, except we're not. Um, our work is at the core highly idealistic and speculative, um, as opposed to merely building. What we do involves conceptualizing relationships, finding links between things that may not seem to be apparent, uh, for example, how people live or work or the traditions of a culture um, or uh, you know, uh, the relationships to the site, for example, and translating that into space. At the same time, our medium is the active and physical environment that we live in with all its complexities and contradictions and its chaos. Um, with every project, we're asked to imagine possible futures for contexts that are constantly evolving while using materials that are, for the most part, static. So once built, a typical project lasts upwards of 80 years, often beyond its original occupants. But even being, to be able to build um, is something that 
you know, we often take for granted, especially here in Switzerland where we actually have a very healthy construction culture. We forget sometimes how fragile the process of realizing a project can be and how much our environments force us to be pragmatic. At any given moment, um, even after winning a competition, the plug can be pulled. A project can be stripped uh, or deformed by forces beyond our control, a, a referendum, shrinking budgets, contentious neighbors. So part of what we started realizing is that sometimes to regain control, we also have to learn to lose that control. I don't know if any of you are familiar with Aikido. Aikido is a form of martial arts, uh, which is particular in the sense that it's not an aggressive practice like jiu-jitsu or karate. In Aikido, instead of attacking, you wait to be attacked. In fact, it's all about using the energy of the attacker to then flip the situation. It's a subversive type of offense that's disguised as defense. It requires you to be aware of your context and to, in some sense, anticipate what is coming your way so that with the least amount of effort, you would be able to recontrol the situation. In a way, you can argue it's the most silent form of the martial arts and also the most resourceful. You can say that we've been trying to look for the Aikido way of designing uh, to accept or even embrace the constraints, the realities of codes and regulations that are thrown our way, uh, the different and often conflicting demands of the users, and to rechannel them as design tactics. Each time that we start a process, we assess what we can or cannot control, not because we want to be pragmatists, but because for us it's important to concentrate our energy on the right things. We're looking for a robustness in architecture that's not defined through forceful imposition, but through the simple framing of a place, like the outline of this dining table. It's a, it's a robustness that emerges from a very specific and maybe even very simple reading of the given set of conditions to produce the greatest breadth of possibilities, perhaps even chaos. In the last couple of years, my office completed a series of institutional buildings, uh, including a secondary school in Rapusvillona and a research institute uh, in Lausanne. In these institutional buildings, the spectrum from the individual to the collective and the corresponding types of activities, from concentrated learning and individual work to collaborative discussions and even competitive sports became ways in which to rethink spatial relationships, in, uh, especially spatial relationships in the everyday. So to take elements of the familiar, uh, for example, certain conventions or characteristics uh, of institutional structures, and to re-question them uh, from their very fundamental basis. These are spaces in which people spend a significant portion of their lives and which the voice and the language of architecture serves more as a backdrop uh, than uh, as a kind of imposition. So quietly negotiating the politics of space. Silent listen in this case not only is uh, thought of as this kind of acoustical atmosphere, but really as a spatial language, as an attitude of architecture in dialogue with the users and of architecture that actively shapes our collective world with spaces that enhance the ways in which we live together. In that sense, we think of ourselves as designing frameworks or flexible infrastructures. The Weiden uh, Secondary School um, is a project about an hour east of Zurich that we finished uh, at the end of 2017. Um, the larger context of the site is rather unremarkable, which is kind of typical of most agglomerations in the periphery of um, Swiss cities. Uh, a little bit of housing, some industrial, still quite a lot of agricultural fields, and then amidst of it all, a school campus. A peaceful oasis of green with uh, an existing primary and secondary school, very sort of low-lying pavilions, very low density, uh, the original secondary school uh, has a capacity for only nine classes, which you see in the kind of largest image there, that's actually this pavilion building. Uh, and the new program for the extension called for 24 classrooms and a double sports hall to be placed anywhere on this campus. So we had two challenges. 
how to add a building that is three times the size of the existing without completely destroying the park-like atmosphere of the site, and how to create a stronger identity to this collection uh, of, of buildings that were already there. We decided that the solution of least impact was to create a singular volume that would stack two floors of classrooms in timber construction on top of the sports hall. The existing plinth would be extended as a common entry court for the two buildings with connection underground. Um, spanning the classrooms over the gym meant that the floor plate was deeper than usual. We took this as an opportunity to gain a space that was not asked for. Uh, instead of corridors leading to the classroom, we introduced a grand central hall on each level. This hall is typically used as a study space, um, but it could also be used for different events, such as a class breakfast that they kind of introduced um, every semester now, uh, where the school um, brings together all the students and, and lays out a kind of uh, long table for the tsunini, um, or you know, a kind of exhibition for, for parents' night. Courtyards bring in light, and break down the scale of the hall into a sequence of more intimate spaces. And when you walk through, the space opens up in the center, but still allows for areas of retreat. Spatially, uh, the courtyards act like rooms, inverting the relationship between inside and outside, where the outside actually becomes an intimate, almost sound insulated room within this kind of larger, more active field. Around the periphery of each floor, uh, the classrooms are connected by an enfilade. Um, this allows not only for the kind of flexible pairing of the rooms, but also for a kind of consciousness uh, of the overall, of the students feeling part of a larger uh, institution. The exposed beams are expressed continuously, which unifies uh, the entire level and extends to the outside, uh, also for the egress balconies that uh, line the building. Here, you're just entering the building uh, with a view into the sports hall, which becomes this kind of event, and the stairs uh, to the classrooms above. The gym, uh, the gym is actually something usually you know, hidden or, or also sometimes uh, you know, put even into an entirely separate uh, building and now all of a sudden becomes a kind of active and central part of the school, producing you know, split screen moments of, of these two worlds quietly colliding. So the gym activates the entry hall, but also um, you know, has views out, you know, back to, in this case to uh, the kind of assembly room above, and also receives you know, ample natural light uh, from the outside allowing the users to be uh, aware of the uh, changing times of day. While the stacking meant a certain height, what was surprising was that despite its size, the building becomes a logical anchor to the entire campus, providing a clear edge to the open space and making the previously oversized plinth a real central plaza. The Institute for Sports Sciences is a project that we won through an open competition in 2013. Um, it's a building on the campus of the University of Lausanne that unites four public and private organizations researching and teaching sports sciences. On first glance, it's a very idyllic site uh, with amazing views of Lake Geneva and the Alps. Uh, you see our, our uh, building, which is in the kind of dark uh, square, and then uh, the gray patch uh, on the lower end of the uh, image is actually Lake Geneva. And so there's an unobstructed view, uh, uh, almost 270 degree view of uh, the lake and beyond. So it's a very prominent site, but the campus was characterized by buildings like these behemoths with fortress-like plinths that really don't have much to do with the landscape uh, that joins them in between. We wanted to offer a counterpoint, something modern and self-confident, but not a complete rejection of the campus, uh, something light and quiet, almost hovering in the landscape, a wolf in sheep's clothing. Typologically, when you study um, office buildings of this size, and you know, the program is mainly offices for researchers and, and professors that are there, um, 
the, you know, when you study office buildings of this size that are roughly you know, 35 to 40 meters in depth, the typical response is to either fill the center where you do, normally don't get any daylight uh, with a massive core or to make a void. And in both cases, the experience is you know, rather expected. So we were interested in rethinking the problem of the center. We wondered what would happen if the center was both the infrastructural core as well as the rich collective experience. Conceptually, we start to split the building into two parts, a kind of hyper-rational and flexible ring of workspaces and a porous mass of service and shared spaces. The outer ring uh, accepted certain conventions of office planning, the modular grid based on the facade that allowed for all the different sizes of offices that I asked for, as well as the flexibility to re repartition in the future, um, a less than five meter depth that allowed every workspace to have optimum daylight, and this hyper-rationality freed us up to explore the core as the architectural experience. A series of alternating stacked bars allowed us to create a kind of internal landscape. Um, this internal mass absorbs all the spaces that don't need daylight. Uh, so for example, the phys physical testing labs where they hook uh, athletes up to machines and measure their heart rates and things like that, as well as uh, vertical shafts, elevators, and stairs, but also bathrooms and kitchens and things like that. Uh, at the same time, it's also the dynamic spatial experience and the collective heart to the project. Um, the competition program had specifically asked for an architectural response to creating synergy between the four different users of the building. For us, this internal landscape uh, of, of vertical circulation could offer chance encounters and informal meetings, um, acting as a counterpoint to the individual private offices of the ring. So as you make your way up, uh, the space begins to open in different directions with views to different floors and also to the outside. Um, the ring allows the different entities to maintain their privacy for people to also control uh, the views into their offices and things like that uh, and, and for them to retreat into a kind of quiet space of concentration. Um, and, you know, of course, they can choose how they would like to relate to the others. At the same time, the kind of visual continuity between these two worlds means that there's a constant awareness of the others and what's happening um, inside the building. Structurally, the two parts work together. The outer ring of lightweight plates and columns is braced by this inner core to form an interdependent whole. Um, and in a way, uh, we'd like to think that this creates a, a, a much better performance um, in general to the building. Before I wrap up, um, I'd like to share a short video that we'd been working on together with another two, um, Laurian Ginitoyu and Arata Mori, and with uh, music by Yu Miyashita.
So in closing, um, while each of our projects has very different contexts and conditions, we're always looking for a way to tweak the conventions and to offer a kind of robustness and generosity in use. Generosity not in terms of quantity of space or materials, um, but of possibilities. It's, you know, I think it used to be understood that these possibilities might be just defined by a kind of a generic type of architecture. But in fact, I think what is important is to realize that the kind of standardized one size fit all, fits all um, no longer holds true. And that the possibilities actually emerge because of a kind of architectural specificity, specificity because of the diversity of conditions and spaces um, that we potentially provide. And that there is a kind of constant dialogue between users and the space. It acknowledges that the many ways in which we're different and, and, and it also offers up choices from you know, the very intimate to the very grand so that you know, everyone can find, in a way, their own space of comfort within the larger collectivity. And these spaces may not appear to speak loudly, but they promote um, a way of being together and living together, a kind of mutual awareness and openness that translates also into spaces of quiet dignity. These social infrastructures in our, in our minds are ways in which architecture is political, uh, building communities one space at a time. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Janet, for this beautiful introduction, presentation of, of your work. Uh, we have a couple of minutes to, to ask questions. Um, I, I, I thought when I saw your presentation uh, about the, uh, Chris Watson's story of the orcas uh, communicating, that there's a, a possibility to communicate uh, via sight, sound, uh, through the spaces, and that that your, your concept of space is not based on insulating and keeping out noise, but more on a kind of a permeability or porosity, uh, that, that it's, it's actually possible to hear. Uh, you don't want to cut it out, you don't want to mute uh, sound, you don't want to have total silence, but rather you want to uh, create uh, an environment where the, the beauty of, of noise and, and sounds also can take But Can you say something about the yeah. acoustic uh, dimension yes. of the programs? Um, I mean, I think what, what's interesting is that, um, you know, in our, in our case, uh, and the, the reason why I was interested in exploring film as a medium to represent our work is that, you know, very often we see architecture shown through static uh, images. And it's, it's kind of a moment frozen in time, which never really is that way when we, re, when we experience them in person. Um, because when we experience the architecture, it's um, always in relation to what we've you know, seen before and where we're going after. And, and in fact, our eyes are always moving, also different from our bodies. Um, but we're also sensing a lot of other things. And part of that has to do with the acoustics of it. And I think one, one thing that we don't realize is how much acoustics contributes also to the overall comfort of a space, you know, and, um, and, and, and what that actually means. Because I think sometimes when you're too shut off and, and it's too uh, dulled in terms of the acoustics of it, you in fact feel way more uncomfortable than if you were having a kind of ambient uh, noise. And so um, in the design of these buildings, especially this last one, uh, where there is this kind of larger hall and there was a sensitivity from the from you know, the client end of it being maybe too noisy and too loud, um, we had to explain to them in terms of that relativity, that, that sense of relationship as you move through space and how you experience that. So it was actually designed as a series of layers, of acoustical layers, you could argue, um, but that each are somehow gr gradients of the next. Um, so, of course, you start in this hall, which is very, very much like a cave in a way that it is, you know, more reverber reverberant, and then you end up in your rooms where it's the quietest and the most, uh, you know, discreet in a way. But, but there's always this kind of transition and this, this way of understanding that you're part of a larger system. Thank you. Uh, yeah, please, one question here and then one here. Uh, go, 
And uh, going back to what you were saying, using film to present architecture, I saw exhibition last November in Shanghai. Um, I have seen a lot of uh, architecture exhibition over the last almost two decades, and this one is very special. It's a Jean Novo. It's presented in the theater, five and a half hour long film. Instead of showing model and the drawings, uh, of, of course you ha won't have five five hours to sit there to to watch. But to me, it convinced me film is very good way to present architecture because there's one element which is time, and with I have seen that I have, I have seen so many architecture show, and this one was re very refreshing because um, the title was "In My Head, In My Eyes, Belonging." It, it's very poetic. And it's very. I just agree with you on that one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you know, the thing is, it's like it, it, I think that you can you can never beat the the physical experience of you being in that space. Um, but I think I, I, at this point, you know, with the technology that we have, uh, or let's say the means that we have, um, the closest thing would be, would be something which actually depicts that time, that passage of time. Yeah. Uh, yes, I, I love light and uh, it's wonderful the way you uh, introduce the light in these buildings. And my question is, how efficient, energy efficient, is light in these times with the materials available in Switzerland? Thank you. Um, so by light, I, I assume you mean daylight. Um, and, and in fact, one thing that I didn't mention, so because of the format of this and the relevance probably to the audience, I didn't talk about the performance of the buildings because, in fact, that was a, high, a huge concern. And that last uh, couple of, the, the, the two buildings that I shown were both very, very performative on um, energy efficiency levels, but also just in terms of the, the approaches to um, uh, sustainability and things like that. And in this uh, last uh, project in Lausanne, um, daylight was of, of huge concern, you know, because it is a majority of workspaces, the comfort of that, um, what that actually means for the users inside, and even in this kind of space, which is in some ways kind of stuck within the building, um, there's ample daylight, um, and there's always daylight filtered in, which means that we actually get to reduce the amount of uh, electrical um, electricity that's being used, um, because we're stretching out the, the day uh, in which that, uh, that daylight actually is, is accessed in the spaces. Yeah, that's, that was one aspect of it. There's also a lot of other things. For example, it's, uh, um, the, the heating and cooling is using lake water, which is pumped through the slabs of the, uh, of the building, which makes it completely um, uh, stable as a, as a comfort zone and, and environment, and also completely energy efficient. Thank you. Uh, last question goes to Hans Ulrich. Yeah, thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. And I had a question. I mean, uh, Erling talked about you know extinction of silence, and we're living in the sixth age of mass extinction, as is Elizabeth Colbert. And of course, uh, the climate crisis uh, brings many questions to architecture. Yes. Concrete uh, is extremely unsustainable, as uh, has recently been a lot reported, and a lot of research goes right now into new materials like mushroom bricks and things like that. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that, a little bit yes. more about that, and how as an architect you address uh, this current climate crisis. Yes, so um, thank you for bringing that up. And I think, you know, of course, the last building is a concrete building. Um, but I think that everything has to be seen also within a larger context in the sense of um, what the building is used for, what its projected lifespan is, and, and taking all of that into account. Because I think that, you know, it's very easy to say, you know, concrete doesn't work. And it's, it's really, you know, and, and of course, there's a huge kind of great energy that's, uh, I don't know if it's, the same term in English as it is in German, graue Energie. But anyways, the, the same uh, uh, sort of um, uh, carbon footprint um, as we, you know, with other um, materials that maybe are, are better about it. Um, but on the other hand, if you look at it in terms of the lifespan of the building, and if this building you know, for an institution like this is to last for 100 years or longer, um, then you start looking at a very different set of criteria. You know, if you're looking, and, and of course, you know, it's very easy, again, to make sort of blanket um, uh, comparisons or, 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 or blanket pronouncements on certain things, but you know, wood always seems to be the thing to, to, um, to champion in this case. Um, because yes, it is uh, a better carbon footprint, for example, for certain places. 
Not, for example, if, you, if you're building in an area where wood is, isn't being produced. So we're working on a project right now in Houston for the extension of an architecture school where we looked into wood. We were thinking, oh, it would be great you know, with the architecture school to think about a wood construction, um, the same way that we did at Viden with the secondary school. Um, but there, they don't actually make wood. <laughs> they don't do you know, wood uh, construction there, so they have to import it sometimes from Europe, which is ridiculous because that increases the carbon footprint. So um, you know, to a certain degree, I think it has to be also thought of on a project-by-project -project basis, um, but also in, in the sense that we have to do the most that we can with whatever we can at that, you know, in that context. And so even with the concrete, we try to push it as much as possible to be as, as efficient as possible and to use it also for what it can be most performative with, which in this case was the thermal mass. So what I was talking about with the lake water and the circulation of the lake water in there, it uses the mass of the concrete to really temper the environment. So we're not using you know, too much extra energy in terms of uh, powering the building. So if you add all of that up and the kind of longevity of the building and not having to replace all of the elements within, you know, the next 20 years, um, then I think the calculation balances out. Yeah. Okay. Once again, thanks very much, Jeanette Kuhl. Big applause, please, for Jeanette.